57th running of the Mobile One. 12 hours of Sebring is underway. The Diesel Monsters all over the Acura on the way to turn one. McNish gets the jump to Ferran, immediately goes to the outside. That's Lammy in that Peugeot, slots into third. There's Rocky. Perhaps the 08 being off the grid has given them a bit of a gap. McNish jumps to the lead, but uh, DeFerrin doing a good job to hold down second. Well, I think DeFerrin knew that he was going to get jumped. Of course, here's a Peugeot leaving from pit lane. Uh, one of the advantages he'll have this year is that the car count isn't as high as usual. He'll go blistering through this field pretty quickly. One thing he has to be very careful of, though, these boys had a warm-up lap. He has not. Sebastian Bourdais, one of the most experienced drivers in the field, got caught out in practice early this week on cold tires and actually shunted that away car. So he'll have to be careful there as he gets up to speed. Well, we'll get a good look right now. You talk about tire temperatures, Calvin. We'll get a good look and we'll see how quickly DeFerrin can get the temperature as his Michelin's not seeming to work so well right now. And he comes right back at it. We talk about this being a 12-hour race. Does he being patient? DeFerrin wanted to hold on to that second position. Miriam McNish flying at the front. Well, here's the problem with the, with the Acura. It is making it speed in the corner, so he's going to have to be aggressive throughout this 12-hour race. He cannot give up corner speeds because he gets out drag race between the corners. On board with Mike Rockenfeller. He's currently in fourth spot. One advantage he may have, he did very few laps in qualifying yesterday to try and keep his tires a little bit fresher for the start of the race today. You can only change one of your four tires after qualifying, so you cannot afford to abuse them during that session. We talk about the 12 hours of Sebring. Obviously a very long event, but guys, this has become a sprint race, has it not? Look at how hard these guys fighting right off the bat. Look at the power of that diesel out, Dorsey, down that back straightaway. These Acuras are going to be fighting this all day long. No question, man. And in traffic, it's going to be another problem for them because if they get hindered on that corner speed, mid-corner speed is their, is their forte. If they get slowed up mid-corner, they're going to just fall back into the hands of these more powerful diesels. Here comes Rockenfeller. He jinxed to the inside. The Audi looks to be hooked up. It really rides the bumps here. This is a notoriously bumpy race circuit. Watch the exit of one there, how it rides the bumps. And then you see the Acura right behind him now. He's dropped to fourth from 1.30 a.m only on speed and look at this battle it is for the overall lead oh, oh that was close he flicks he's jinging around he's putting the pressure <laughs> on this is fantastic stuff alan mcnish realizes he has a real race car in terms of he can really take the fight to peugeot and not just win these races on strategy anymore it may be early in the going here at sebring but the battle up front has been being waged since the drop of the green flag. Right now, Pedro Lamy in the 07 Peugeot, that beautiful black and white and blue closed cockpit. The coupe leads Alan McNish in that brand new Audi R15. Behind him, that beautiful silver open top prototype. Right there, McNish flashes into the screen and interesting pit stop strategies early on. Well, we see that the 07 got out front, and Alan McNish had about an 11-second lead prior to those Ryan pit stops. We saw Alan take tires. We didn't see the finish of the 07 pit stop, but we understand they did not take tires, so that was how they jumped ahead of him and leapfrogged Alan McNish. But Dorsey, you know, double stinning these tires. We didn't see it a lot last year on this type of race circuit. We'll have to see how this works out halfway through this stint. He may be good now, but he suddenly gets another 15 laps or so on these tires. Will they be worn out? You know, the other thing I saw, Calvin, is that McNish has been able to run down the Peugeot twice now and get right up on the back of it. When he gets there, he loses his he loses his momentum. I'm wondering if it's an aero issue when he gets up behind this Peugeot, if he's not losing the front of the car a little bit. Because he's right Look at in this, the He's tight there now. <laughs> he didn't lose anything. He's 13. He looks to the inside. I don't think there's enough room. There's a high speed entry coming up through that left hander. But he is making a nuisance of himself now. <laughs> this that. is fantastic stuff. Really picking up when we last saw these two great marks battle out at Petit Le Mans. It was a McNish against the Peugeot. Here we see coming off turn 16. The big run down the back straightaway. Tucked right underneath that rear wing. You ride on board the R15. The draft taking effect. He'll get him oh, late on wow. the brakes. This is where the bumps are. We've got oh, traffic in the way. The 11 car, the Viper, McNish, back to the front. They split that Viper. That was good. We didn't see that coming. And all of a sudden, that, that's a big car, that Viper, too. Believe me. <laughs> Spectacular stuff from Alan McNish. And yet, that's what you expect from him. Yeah. We've seen it time and time again. Now that the table's turned, I want to see what the Peugeot can do now that it's from behind. It did take Alan two, two, three attempts, really, to, to make that stick. It wow. really took him to be right underneath that rear wing before we kind of saw that there was a gap. The Peugeot looked to have a little bit more straightaway speed, but that was the effect of the aerodynamic effect of the draft.
see Allen flashing his lights there at the traffic, and that's a P2 car. This is one of the cars that he had to battle last year, and you'll see a big speed differential this year. And now perhaps traffic might bring it all back, but I mean, this is gonna go down as one of those things you wanna see. Look at the Pujo, a little wiggle there. McNish closes up. And he's out in the dirt there, Dorsey. So you're gonna get a little bit of pickup on your tires, and now we see Allen right on the power. Getting off turn 13, he thinks about it here, but there's not enough room. That little wiggle was all it took. I mean, Pedro had to get out of the front just a little bit right there. And of course, here's the draft by. He's got it tucked right up underneath, like you said. And, and was, this pass was let happen, I should say. There was no resistance here. But watch when the brakes get applied. Look how quickly it happens. Watch the oh. traffic. Look for the traffic. That's oh. what I'm talking about. <laughs> Decisive by Alan McNish. He just flashes it to the end. The 07 Peugeot was holding down second. Rockefeller has taken it. And we'll show you how some dramatic stuff. It was great stuff. And remember, the Peugeot was double stinging their tires. Is this a factor here? They're dealing with traffic. This down the hip in the 40 car. Andrea Robertson just... Uh, cut the wings off that Persia a little bit allowed Rocky to get very close from Mike Rockefeller's point of view and he goes ooh can I take advantage of this well, surprisingly they come off the hairpin pretty equal but then remember where the car got loose when Alan McNish passed it here it does again watch it steps out here just a moment and loses momentum yep there's the little wiggle and Rockefeller right up there to pounce and you know I, I think at that point in time Rami just let it happen, but Watch take a it. look from on board with Mike. See, that's all it takes, just a little bit of a slide there. Rocky there. It's a pass here, how the pass was made with Christensen, and it was traffic. Oh, that's a cheeky move. Great one. <laughs> that's how you win eight Le Mans. And you know when to do it. You know when to pull the trigger. This is what it looked like if you're Tom Christensen. Christian clean, kind of bottled just a little bit. He's trying to be patient. Well, Tom had already had to move committed to the inside and just flicked it to the inside. He's take another look. Tom looks to the outside. Christian thinks, no, I'm not going to do that. And Tom says, thank you very much. That's what you call opportunistic. Why do it at high speed when you can do it at low speed? All new supercars exposed Monday night at 9 Eastern here on speed. It is German precision versus American muscle. It is the Porsche Turbo against the Corvette ZR1. See which supercar comes out on top. You can say that right here, too. Look what's going on up on screen here. You betcha. Welcome back to Sebring. Lee Diffie along with Dorsey Schrader, Justin Bell, and Kelly Stavis. Calvin stepped out for a rest check. Take a look at this. Frank Montaigne. He's got plenty of experience in the American Le Mans series after running for Andretti Green last year. He's a full Peugeot man in 2009, and he is hassling Alan McNish. Took a while for that Peugeot's tires to come in, but now that they are, he's right on McNish's tail. Actually caught him off in traffic. And this oh. is where the cars are good through turn one. Straight line speed of that Peugeot and now it's back in front the 908 leads the 12 hours of Sebring McNish will not like this he do, you don't see that happen to Allen very often do you now we get to see them as close as they've been and will McNish go with him Tom Christensen was able to reel that gap in on Sebastian Bordet when he hit it and that is what in turn put McNish out in front when they executed a driver change Bordet got out Montaigne got in now let's see if the Scott can go with him Traffic up ahead, it won't be a problem. It's the 45 flying lizard machine. Or will it be a problem? Yes, it is! Oh. McNish on the inside! I told you he didn't like being second, and now he's back in the lead in the Audi. Wow, they used the flying lizard Porsche as a pick. McNish set that up perfectly. Didn't get the Peugeot a chance to get there. How about that? There's only one place Alan McNish likes to be, and that is out in front. I think that was his wake-up call, Lee. You know, I don't know that he knew that Mentani was coming that quickly. Well, he'd be getting updates from the team. He's got his mirrors. He monitors things very closely. He's a student of the sport. He is one of the best sports cars ever. And as Calvin mentioned earlier in this broadcast, the American Le Mans Series fans voted him driver of the decade of the American Le Mans Series. And that is not a title given lightly. Now, as there's a gap, a more restful gap between McNish and Montagne. Now, let's take you back and show you that again. That was some pretty powerful stuff. It really was. It was Montagne that was setting it up. It was actually going on for about two laps as he was trying to position himself. Here, he gets to run down the front straightaway side by side. 140 mile per hour touch right there. McNish got out of the way and lets it happen. 
but it didn't make him happy. In fact, it woke him up. I don't think he liked that a bit. Allen may have had to lift just a little bit. They're coming down the chute here, down towards the hairpin. This time it's McNish's turn as he's reading the traffic up ahead. You got the Flying Lizard Porsche. He realizes they're going to go into the corner side by side. He gets to choose which one to go. He goes to the inside. That leaves Montani nowhere to go. <laughs> this was a case of you want to fight with me? <laughs> yeah. Here's what you're dealing with. See, there was no block, and Montani is stuck right there to the outside. And he had to get out of it. And Allen split, caught up there by the Farnbacher Lowell's Porsche. Capello thought about an inside move. There was no option. And you have to think, without he having two guns right behind this Peugeot, that Dindo Capella would probably be given the all clear by his management to go for it. Be aggressive. Trade some body work, maybe. Who knows? I mean, <laughs> you've got your teammate right behind you. You want to win this race, certainly. You don't want to take chances. You don't want to be dirty. But he can certainly afford to force the issue here. We've already heard Christensen say it. We've heard uh, McNish say it. It was good to get right up close to the Peugeot. Have a good look at them. See where they're strong. See where we're strong. Find out the weaknesses. Now let's see how determined and how passionate they are about winning this race here. Will that give them some momentum like you cannot believe if Peugeot beat Audi heading to Le Mans this year? There is such a bounce in the step of all of those Audi drivers. They just love this car. I mean, it's immediately on the pace. It's fast. It feels good. It has balance. It doesn't have any nasty vices. Is it perfect? Certainly not. No race car is, and they realize they've still got to do some work on here and really finesse this car, and I'm sure there's some different bodywork and trim that will be running at LaSalle with those long straightaways, but right now it has a good feel, and that's what it's all about. It needs to roll off the trailer the first time and have a good immediate feel. You don't need to be fighting all season long nasty vices what are yours <laughs> hanging out with you i think is the you, worst one you're a chocolate man aren't you huh that's your biggest vice this is close though this is serious racing at the front as alan mcnish said now this is proper racing this is what it's all about let's get to it three hours 39 minutes to go capello's looking for a way through dindo got an excellent exit off of turn 17 he got a better run he got a better run here can he make the move under braking no sarah's and defends great stuff these boys are going at it like a sprint race there is still so much time to go in this race and capello is testing sarazen to the ultimate limit he has more grip right now he has more grip he can get the power down earlier he can carry the mid corner speed sarazen is feeling the pressure what does his management team tell him Dindo Capello to the inside for the lead of this race. Sarazen thought about closing the door, but Capello had already jammed it. Great stuff. New race leader. Capello looks in his mirror very quickly, but the Peugeot man is about two car lengths back. 26 laps on this stint. They went 30-31 on the previous one, so we could see them hitting pit lane in the next four or five laps. How much margin can Dindo Capello stretch during that time? Let's take a look at it from above. Good play. Great racing. Yep, we're ready too. <laughs> Here he comes from a long way back, and grip is not just in the corners, it's under braking. There you see Dindo Capello totally on the limit there, just slightly locking up the brakes as he gets the car down to apex. Sarazan saw him coming, and maybe he got the call on the radio. We're talking about strategy and winning one of these races, executing a race. Maybe that's the difference this year for Peugeot. Stretch down the almond straight into Sunset Bend and turn 17. Audi know how to do it in endurance racing. They've won on debut with the R8, the R10, and now the R15 does it for the very first time. And Tom Christensen is the most successful at Sebring with five overall victories. Audi has done it again.